Good evening and welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Um, welcome to the February edition of our Winter Warmer online talk series, which is aimed at bringing you something a bit different during these winter months and to highlight and showcase different features of our wonderful Royal Parks. I am Ade, I'm a trainee learning officer at the Royal Parks and we are the charity that looks after the eight Royal Parks in London. These are Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, the Green Park, St James's Park, Regent's Park and Primrose Hill, Bushy Park, Green Park and Richmond Park. We also manage the incredible Brompton Cemetery and Victoria Tower Gardens. Through our work, we aim to welcome Londoners and visitors alike so that everyone can enjoy the spectacular nature and fascinating heritage that the parks have to offer, their well-being benefits and to protect and improve the precious biodiversity of the parks. We're putting this series of talks on for free because we want to share our enthusiasm and love for these special places with as many people as possible. So we're delighted to welcome so many of you to join us this evening. The Royal Parks is a charity, so while it, the talk is free, we would greatly appreciate any donation that you can make. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat to do that if you'd like to support our work. So without further ado, I will introduce tonight's guest speaker. Nick Burnham joined the Royal Parks in March 2023. He is the Senior Wildlife Officer based in St James's Park. As well as looking after the pelicans, Nick also monitors the welfare of the wildlife within the inner parks, including St James's, the Green Park, Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens. Nick is here today to talk about the amazing wildlife that can be found in St James's Park, its unique history and what conservation projects are coming up in the future. So we're all very lucky to be spending an hour getting Nick's perspective from the very centre of one of London's oldest parks. So without further ado, Nick, it's over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Adi. All right. OK, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk. Thank you so much for coming along. I do really appreciate it. And as Ade mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the wildlife we have in St James's Park, in particular, these stunning birds that we have that are the pelicans. So to give you a rough idea of what's going to happen in this next 40, 50 minutes or so, Firstly, I'm going to mention a little bit, a little bit about who I am. I know that um, Ade's touched on a few things already. Next, we'll talk a bit about the history of the wildlife in the park, how the wildlife has changed over the last well, few hundred years, really. And then we'll touch a lot about the pelicans, the famous six that we have that you can see in that shot here. And then we'll move on to conservation. So ideas of what we've been doing in the past, what we're doing now and ideas that we have going forward into the future. And finally, I'm going to show you a few different tricks about wildlife ID. I'm no expert in being able to tell what animal is what, but no one has to be. There's so many different sources, apps, books, everything, you name it. And it's just finding the right resources I find are important. So I'll give you a few tricks just to finish off. So firstly, who am I? As Ade mentioned, I'm, my name's Nick, I'm Nick Burnham. I'm the Senior Wildlife Officer for the for the Royal Parks, largely based in the inner parks. So with the inner parks, that means St James's Park, where the pelicans are, the Green Park, Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, and actually to an extent, Brompton Cemetery as well. And on a very rare occasion, I go and help out in Greenwich Park. I don't do too much work in the outer parks, so Richmond Park and Bushy Park, largely due to location, and they have senior wildlife officers out there who predominantly work with the deer, so the deer ranges essentially. There are various aspects of my role. One is looking after the pelicans, which is really important. Another one is monitoring the water bodies for sick and injured birds or any sort of wildlife, if you like. And there's a little bit on bird ringing and bird counting as well, which these pictures are. So as you can see on this picture on the right hand side here, we have three of last year's cygnets. I'll talk a little bit about this later on but it shows how varied the days can be and how multitasking is key. So here I'm holding a signet whilst taking an order for a, for the fish that we were getting coming in for uh, for the pelicans. The guy coming along was lost somewhere along horse cars parade or the mall. So I had to show him where to go. Um, as Ade mentioned, I joined in March last year, in March, 2023. My previous role was in zookeeping at London Zoo. So not that far away. So most of my 
sort of working life has been around animal husbandry and conservation, that sort of thing. Oh, did I go? Hang on. No, I didn't. I thought I went one too many there. So history of wildlife in the park. So this aerial shot here, you can see the Mall. You can see St. James's Park on the left hand side. Just beyond it there, you can actually even see Green Park and beyond that even Hyde Park. So the idea is you could actually walk all the way from Kensington Gardens through to Hyde Park, through to Green Park, all the way through to St. James's Park without actually barely leaving any green space. So they are really well connected and it's a wonderful route. St. James's Park takes its name from St. James the Less. It's a leper hospital that was on that was situated on the site and it was a very marshy area, St. James's Park as well. It had the River Tyburn flowing into it. During his reign, King Henry VIII actually took the area of marshland that covers these four parks. So St. James's Green, Hyde and into Kensington. He took it for his own in 1532. And he built a red brick hunting lodge, which is actually just on the bottom right hand side is St. James's Palace now where it is today. So this bit here on the right hand side. So that was his hunting lodge and the rest of it were his hunting grounds for the deer. So it's a good indicator of where it actually began was mainly for for deer ranging, well, for, for, for hunting deer. And yeah, it's so actually at the time wasn't as built up as this. So it was quite a big open space. The large, um, the large deer park has changed multiple over times, which I will carry on and talk, talk to you about. But um, the one thing I'd like to say interestingly about St. James's Palace is it's still used today, not as a hunting lodge, but it does actually, whilst Buckingham Palace is the host's where the king lives and many other things like that. It actually is used as an entertainment space. So for state visits and the like, last December, we had the president and first lady of Korea come and they were actually hosted in St. James's Palace. So moving on to the next sort of part with the wildlife change, it seems that each monarch had a slightly different adaptation of what they wanted to do. So James I, he drained the area of the park and landscape, landscaped it to form what is sort of the park shape that you now see. And he actually opened it to the public. He allowed the upper class, so he called it, to stroll around and enjoy it. And he also was an avid collector of exotic animals. So he had a huge menagerie and often got gifts and that sort of thing. Parts of his and, and menagerie included elephants, he had camels, antelopes, beavers, crocodiles, and even wild boar. From what I've read, supposedly an elephant was gifted in 1623 by the King of Spain. So the sort of gift you give to someone in central London, interestingly enough. And a lot of the names and things around the park kind of originate from the wildlife that was there. So along the south side of the park, we have Birdcage Walk. And that is due to the fact that there was a large aviary that ran all the way down it. So the road still itself called Birdcage Walk, it has some of that origins and a bit of that history still there, which I think is quite fantastic. On the southeast corner of the park, I'll show you a map and a couple of slides to make it a bit more clear, lies Stories Gate. It's one access into the park that you get roughly from Parliament Square. And there is Stories Gate Cafe, which is a really nice cafe. But the origins of that actually come from the Keeper of the Averies. And the Keeper of the Averies was a man called Edward Story. And he was the keeper during the reign of King Charles II. So it's just really interesting to see how these names have originated due to wildlife, which I think is quite, quite fascinating. So as you can see here, we've got Birdcage Walk, which you'll see if you go along the south side of St. James's Park. And you have Stories Gate Cafe, which actually is a really nice cafe. And this picture is just the idea of what the lake looks like now. That was frozen over. That isn't a photo from this year, but it did happen this year. It did completely freeze over as well, which was quite astonishing. So Charles II did a big redesign of the park. He introduced a large canal that went down the middle of it, but it wasn't the shape that we see today. It was more this really long straight line, um, less sort of naturalistic looking, but um, still really cool. The first introduction of the water, if you like. And he created what is now known as Duck Island as well. And he took a lot of his inspiration from his exile in France. So when he came back, yeah, and he opened it up more to the public as well, which was quite fantastic. He was a huge lover of wildfowl. He had many different exotic and native wildfowl that they did breed in the, on, on the island and in the park as well. 
But the most famous residents they had were the pelicans. The pelicans pictured here, these are the ones we have now, they were a gift in 1664 to King Charles II from the Russian ambassador. So it's quite staggering, really. It's about what's it, 360 years, more or less, that pelicans have been, no, 460 years, sorry. 460 years, I'm losing my maths now. Oh, no, it might be 300, <laughs> that um, pelicans have been associated with the parks. More or less in that time, we've had pelicans. I don't know for certain if there was a gap at all, but right now we have six. But the, historically, I've got data going back over 100 years, and we've had pelicans throughout that entire period, which I think is quite incredible. John Nash, people might have heard of him, designer. He designed, sort of redesigned the park in 1829 to give this naturalistic looking, looking setting. And that was the curvature of the lake, the winding paths, more recognizable as you see it today. And finally, Duck Island Cottage. So that is Duck Island Cottage, which is pictured here in front, well, in the in the background of the pelicans. If you're familiar with St. James's Park, it is on the east side of the park. And it's it's quite it's 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 beautiful. It's got this lovely allotment right out in front of it. It's got that sort of Swiss look and it's directly opposite to Downing Street as well. So it's in quite a prime location. The cottage itself was actually used to be the house for the keeper of the birds. So the cottage as we see it now was completed in 1841 by John Watson and he and the move was instigated by the um, Orphanological Society. So we've got a lot of them to thank for. But since 1994, it has been the home of the London Historic Parks and Gardens Trust. So that left hand side of the building is now more of an office space and the right hand side is a bit of a storage space. The last keeper well, the bird keeper to live at the lodge was a man called Thomas Hinton. He lived there with his family from 1900 to 1953, so around 53 years. Since then, uh, they deemed it wasn't really suitable residence anymore, which is a shame because technically now I'm the bird keeper and I could live in Westminster, but, um, you know, never mind. But um, we've got really cool connections with that. Actually, we had a letter which my, our park manager Mark sent to me from um, his grandniece. So Thomas Hinton, who lived in the who lived in that house, his grandniece has contacted us, and her name's Annie Barkley, and she showed sh shared us a few stories that she heard about that time. And supposedly Thomas Hinton actually allowed Queen Margaret and Queen Elizabeth to come feed the birds as well. So that's a really cool sort of royal connection that we've we've always had, and it's nice to still have connections with the families of of bird keepers of the past. So as I said, this is St. James's Park as we as we know it today. So to give you a rough idea of what I was talking about, we've got Birdcage Walk along the bottom here. So you can still see the name coming up all the way to Stories Gate down on the bottom right. And then coming up here to Horse Guards Road, you have Duck Island Cottage and Duck Island. So just to give you an idea of what I was talking about, it's easier to get a view on sort of a map, a map image. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the wildlife that we have in the park today before touching on the pelicans. So even today, it's still home to an exotic waterfowl collection, wildfowl collection that we have. So if you walk around the lake, you may see different birds that you might not quite recognize, birds that aren't usually found within the UK. A couple of examples are there on the screen. You've got the black swan next to the more common mute swan, so you can get an idea of their differences. And then we've also got the hooded maganza on the top right, which I think is an absolutely beautiful bird. Amongst other birds, we have the ruddy shell duck, red-breasted geese, and yeah, many more, which is really cool. As well as these collection birds, we have many wild and established birds, shall I say. So we have wild birds, lots of waterfowl, and also other birds as well. So you see we've got the tawny owl there in the bottom left-hand side. And established birds, the ones I mean are the sort of non-native, so Egyptian geese, Canada geese, ring-necked parakeets. We do also have a number of bats. We get pipistrelles who you actually see at night. If you go around dusk time, you'll see them sort of flying low over the water, which is really beautiful. And we also get birds that turn up at different times of year. So during the winter, we've seen red wings as well, which is really cool. And a personal favorite of mine is the red breast, uh, sorry, the great crested greaves that we have. We had um, them breed last year and they were really, really cute. We conduct monthly counts and bird ringing in the park, as I said. And that's a really good way to understand what birds are coming in and out, out of the parks and what 
what birds are arriving at different times of year. So you, if you turn up in one month, it'll be completely different to the following month and the populations will change over time as well. So we conducted some bird ringing in January and we were able to catch quite a few black headed gulls, some mallard ducks, grey lag geese and coots. And we actually had a black headed gull that already had a ring on it from the Zoological Society of Helsinki. So it had come from Finland only to be grabbed again in London. But it's a really cool indication of how these birds move around the world. And yeah, it's a really cool product to be part of, which I really enjoy. As, I, as you saw on the map before, we have the two islands. We have Duck Island and we have West Island as well, at the other end of the lake. They're absolutely really important havens for the wildlife and the ground nesting birds. So grey lag geese, swans, all the duck species that we have because the footfall is so low. Yes, Duck Island has a bridge and occasionally we go over there, but West Island you can only access by boats or by waders. And to give you an idea of the how low the footfall is, I went on that island three times last year and I'm pretty sure I was the only person who went on it. So it has no paths, it's very overgrown, but it's left for the wildlife, which is very rare for an area in the middle of Westminster. But um, if you turn up and around springtime, when all the hatch, when the, all the birds start to hatch, it's amazing. You go one day with nothing, and then you get this explosion of goslings coming out of the island. And so they all seem to turn up at the same time, which is uh, quite a very exciting sight to see. So the main bulk of my talk, which you are probably quite excited about, I'm assuming that's why most people have joined the talk, are the pelicans. So I'm going to talk a lot about pelicans in general. Uh, the pelicans that we have on the island are just why I think they're so weird and wonderful and fantastic. So on the right hand side here, you have our six pelicans that we have. The slightly browner ones are our younger pelicans. So that's sort of the downy feathers they had. So when they first arrived, those ones, sorry, it was about six months or so before they had that sort of fully white adult plumage. So pelicans, people don't tend to notice, but there are actually eight different species of pelican. They, they are found all over the world. The ones that we have are the eastern white pelicans, but historically we've also had the American white pelicans. We've had brown pelicans that come from America as well. You can also get Peruvian pelicans, which are fairly rare, pink-backed pelicans, spot-billed pelicans, Dalmatian pelicans, which are the largest ones, and the Australian white pelicans as well. So there's a huge array of different ones that we have. And they range from what we say as least concern to near threatened. So there is the, a list called the IUCN Red List, which is the International Union of Conservation of Nature. And their aim is to sort of get every species on Earth uh, a grading of how threatened it is to extinction. And that can go from extinct all the way up to least concern. So least concern means the populations are stable, they're rising. Extinct obviously means there's no more, but then it, Critically endangered, endangered are really important labels where we can sort of target conservation focuses. So the rarest pelicans are the Peruvian ones, I believe, but the ones we have, the eastern white pelicans, are actually doing rather well, which is really nice. We've had three different species in St. James's in the last century. As I mentioned, that's the American white pelican, the brown pelican, and the eastern whites that we have now. And they are largely pescatarian. So we feed them roach, they get lots of different species of fish, but they don't always eat fish. So um, I'll put a little um, disclaimer out now. I do a couple little videos to show you. One is actually from St. James's Park and one is actually from a BBC Earth of David Attenborough. If you're a little bit squeamish or don't want to see a pelican eating animal, please, uh, please look away now. But it is part of nature, it's part of wildlife. So um, I, personally, I find it quite fascinating. So. Let me show you this news article first. So that was the first one. That was a BBC sort of news documentary, news footage of the pelicans in the park. And uh, yeah, that was in St. James's Park where it did eat a pigeon hole much to a lot of people's surprise. Let's see if this next one works. Here we go. Just so you know, there's no sound, Nick, just as an FYI. Right. No worries. This one is fairly self-explanatory. I'll talk it through if there's no sound. So 
essentially what's happening here is these are the eastern white pelicans and they are on an island of, called Malgas Island, I think, off South Africa. And it has a really large population of gannets, the seabird, the beautiful birds. And now due to sort of climate change, the both sets of parents of the gannets are now having to fly off further and further in search of food. It used to be that one would fly off and the other would look after the chick. And now quite often both parents fly away. And this hasn't gone unnoticed by the eastern white pelicans. So you can see them here sort of walking through the group. Any of them that are too big or have parents, they tend to avoid. But any of these smaller gannets, unfortunately, they sort of pick as fair game. So it, um, it's almost like a, a giant walking buffet. It's quite um, ominous looking when you see them here as well. But um, it, is, it is unfortunate. Well, here you go. You go and yeah they they do tend to eat their food whole it's unfortunate sort of consequence of climate change but you could argue it's a very opportunistic feeding from the pelicans as well noticing a behavioral change in one bird and then taking advantage of that given how many gannets there are however they don't seem to be taking too many and a lot of them still have both sets of parents there which is actually really quite useful and uh, as you can see there that's what they'll do they'll swallow it completely whole they do that with the fish that we have in the in the lake as well and there you can see the parents are defending them off when they can. But often that's not always the case. Or if you're a slightly plumper or you're a slightly bigger gannet, you might be able to defend yourself, which uh, which is very important. But um, it's a very interesting sight to see. And it's definitely a sort of a human induced behavioral change due to climate change, which is quite remarkable. And there they're flying off away. So meet today's squadron. So there are there are, these are the pelicans that we have in the park right now. There are many different collective nouns you can use for pelicans. There is pod, there is scoop, there is pouch. But in my personal opinion, squadron is the best one. It usually does refer to a larger group. So I tend to say we have a small squadron. We have six, but it's just a very cool way to describe them. We have I'd like to describe them in three sets. So we have sun, moon and star. They were the three with the sort of brown downy feathers that you saw in the, the uh, couple slides earlier. They came to us in 2019, around April or May time. And they came from Prague Zoo in the Czech Republic. Prague Zoo have this really cool captive breeding program and uh, they've been really, really nice in sort of helping us out. Interestingly enough, they helped us out with Tiffany and Isla as well. So Tiffany and Isla came in 2013. Their move was sponsored, well, funded by the Tiffany Foundation, hence that one of the pelicans was called Tiffany. Isla was actually down to a public vote, which I think is a very sweet name. Sun, Moon and Star actually in turn were named prior to arriving. And um, all of them, yeah, all of them came from Prague Zoo, which is really cool. So they range from what now, 10, 11 years old to four or five years old and then we have gargi if anyone's heard of any of our pelicans it is probably gargi she is the only pelican that can truly fly the other ones did have their wings clipped when they were born in the zoo and the reason for this with gargi is that she's technically not our bird so she was found in a garden in south end in 1996 and no one claimed it she actually is believed to be a truly wild bird I've been told around that time two other pelicans were found unfortunately dead along the east coast of the UK and we do genuinely believe that maybe it was a migration pattern gone wrong and they ended up a bit too far west and I think she was just absolutely exhausted and she landed. Luckily St James's tend to be well known for having pelicans so we were contacted and went down to uh, pick her up which is really quite fortunate as well because we had the eastern white pelican so we had the exact same species and she was brought to St James's Park where she's been ever since. So that was in 1996. So she is what, 27, 28? But truth be told, she was an adult when she was found. So we don't really know how old she is. They can live up to 50 years old. So she could have another 20 years, which would be fantastic. And if you're looking at them as a group, she has a slightly more orange bill. I don't think it's to do with age, but that's if you're ever in the park and trying to recognize her. But you wouldn't know she was any older than the rest. She's just as quick, just as nimble. And she every now and then soars around the park, which is really, really cool. 
as I mentioned previously, I know we've got the three different species. Interestingly, the pelicans caused a little bit of, um, let's say, a pelican's arms race during the period of the Cold War. So um, in the 1950s, an American ambassador actually sent over four brown pelicans. This is how the story goes, because they'd heard that our pelicans were originally supplied by the Russian ambassador. So they couldn't believe that we were taking taking sides with the Russians. So they actually sent some American American pelicans over. Unfortunately, these four brown pelicans that they brought over didn't actually fare too well. They really struggled. They looked malnourished. They started getting thin and there were accusations of poisoning and all sorts of things. But the main reason is the brown pelicans are largely a saltwater bird. They're a saltwater species that did not survive on the lake. Um, then the ambassador actually sent out some American white pelicans, which are more capable in freshwater, and they survived much fairer. And uh, the crisis was avoided. They they lived absolutely fine alongside the eastern white pelicans. So um, luckily, uh, another Cold War was avoided in that sense. They do tend to roam. They tend to move around. They tend to walk around and they love the benches. As you can see here, they don't care if there are people. They don't care if you're sitting on the bench. If they see a bench, they will take it. And here, hopefully this video works. This was Gargi in December, so only about three months ago. I heard a loud, large honking noise when I was trying to count them and I couldn't see where she was. I looked up and there she was flying above me. It's absolutely beautiful. They have the second largest wingspan of all flying birds behind the giant albatross. And you see you've got Buckingham Palace in the background. It's quite surreal to see something so prehistoric looking flying over central London, which um, I'm, my view is amazing. Every now and then she does fly a little bit further afield. So last April, she actually flew to Richmond. She was on the Thames only for about a day or two. Ironically enough, it was my day off. So I blamed my boss, which was which was quite nice. And when I came back in the following day, she was back in the park as if nothing had happened. So um, yeah, always keep an eye out. I think it's around April, May time. Sometimes she gets a bit twitchy and she'll fly off. She has been to Regent's Park as well and actually been to the zoo from what I hear because they have the same species as well. As I said, they tend to wander off and they tend to get stuck. So on the left hand side, this was actually January this year. So only a month ago when it got really, really cold and the lake froze over. This is Sun, our male on the ice there. They tend to sleep on Pelican Rock, which is the rock on the right hand side. And all the other five pelicans managed to navigate their way off the ice to the edge of the water to be fed, which was brilliant. Sun, on the other hand, got onto the ice and then couldn't move. After this picture was taken, he actually lay down and he got no traction. He just couldn't stand up again. He couldn't move. He couldn't kind of move his wings out the way. So after about half an hour, I realized we're going to have to do something here. Um, the My boss, the other, the assistant park manager, he um, helped me. We tried to get a boat, but the ice was so thick. I think it was a couple centimeters. The, we couldn't actually get anywhere with the boat. So we had to don some neoprene waders and smash the ice to go and save sun. It was quite a different day, and I'm certain I'm on half of London's uh, camera roll on that day as well. We managed to get over to Sun, smashed all the ice, grab him, move him to the side. And we stayed in the water for a bit, just clearing a bit more ice. And I looked up, and about 100 metres down, Sun had got stuck again. He'd got himself back onto the lake and couldn't move. So the second time we got him, we put him in this sort of quarantine area that we have on the island. It's where we keep the pelicans when they first arrived to us and he had a timeout of three days till the ice melted because he couldn't be trusted. On the right hand side we have two of our pelicans that actually went for quite a large stroll. So this is the Citadines Hotel just beyond Trafalgar Square. So to get here from St James's Park you have to cross Horse Guards Parade, cross Whitehall and go down another road. It's about a 10 minute walk, like eight to 10 minute walk. This was before I joined, but um, someone on the way to work actually spotted them on the bus and called ahead. And in the end, apparently it was the police that picked them up and dropped them off into the park. So it's almost like they got in trouble and lost on a night out and got brought home. And uh, to give you a reference, it's quite near Embankment Station. So yeah, they went for a proper good old wonder.
Okay, so next what I'm going to talk to you a bit about now is the conservation that's going on in the park. So currently ongoing ones and ones from the past and a few ones on the future. So this is a view, where are we from? From about Horse Guards Parade facing down the lake. You are on the right hand side, eventually you'll have the cafe and all the way down is the Blue Bridge. One thing we've done in the last 20 years or so is kind of remove the hard borders that are associated with parks. So historically the park would just sort of have concrete, going all the way into the water and there was no marginals, nothing where, nothing there for sort of other wildlife to thrive. We have a lot of reed beds now, which are really, really, really brilliant. One, they do filter water fantastically well. And we've actually started getting reed warblers as well. So we're getting other species turn up, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, at first glance, it um, isn't too surprising to see that the wildlife in St. James's Park does go unnoticed. We are in the middle of a big tourist area. We have changing of the guard, we have Buckingham Palace, we have Churchill War Rooms, we have Downing Street, everything around. And people kind of use St. James's Park as a cut through. But what's quite fantastic is if you stop to look around, it is a mini oasis and definitely worth walking through because you don't, you kind of forget for a little while that you're in, um, that you're in uh, the centre of London. So a few projects, the main project I'll talk about is Duck Island. So this picture here, you might recognize it if you've ever been in St. James's Park and crossed the Blue Bridge. It's probably one of the most common photos taken of the park. The left hand side, you've got Horse Guards Parade. The right hand side, you've got the London Eye. And this little patch of trees here, which is usually just settled in the background that people don't look at, that is Duck Island. And it is one of the most important sites of conservation that we have within St. James's Park. And it doesn't look like much, but it's surprisingly large as well. And it's a unique patch of land that we do loads of work on. So once a month, we get volunteers to come onto the island. They're fantastic. I think it's the third Thursday of the month. I'll have to check, but we have volunteers in all the parks. And if you ever are interested in volunteering, please do. They are, it's really good fun. On Duck Island, for once you get to see sort of behind the scenes area but we do loads of things. There's habitat management, we do bulb planting, we do dead hedge planting. In Christmas, we actually made reefs of all the things that we could find on the, on the island itself. And we do have a few current projects ongoing. So it's a few pictures here. They don't look like a lot, but they are really important future projects. So one is this sheltered reed bed pool. So currently we have a small inlet here on, it's the top right picture that you can see. And our idea now, it's actually starting to get into fru to fruition. We've cleared a lot of the, a lot of the sort of um, overgrown brambles and uh, what else was there? Sort of stinging nettles and things that are all along the bank. And we're starting to add a dead hedge and add a bamboo hedge along the right hand side. So we're using sort of non-native species that are on the island and repurposing them. And we're going to make a big barrier to stop any geese coming in before we plant marginal plants and try and make this a little bit of a small pond-like habitat which i think would be really cool if we plant everything first without any barriers the geese will just absolutely destroy it so it has to come in phases this bottom right photo here we have the kingfisher bank so it is the south side of duck island we sort of had this clay bank with a couple holes dug into it it doesn't look like much now but we have seen kingfishers in and around the parks in duck island and whatnot, but we haven't seen them nesting. So we're trying to give them a little helping hand. They like to nest in these holes in these cavities. So we've dug out some holes in the clay with the hope that they will turn up and breed. So that's one for the future, fingers crossed. This on the left hand side here, now I've written air raid shelter. Also, I think it was more of an ammunition store as well. So it goes deep underground and it's kind of derelict now. So you go down these steps and you've got these two rooms, which we're looking to repurpose as a bat roost. So we've got a small little entry point on the top. Our idea is going to trim down a few of these sort of plants above it and maybe take away some of the trees to give them sort of a flight path for these sort of common pipistrels that we have. I think we also have soprano pipistrels. You see them flying at dusk, as I said, but we want to try and encourage them to roost and encourage more places for them to live. So that is a really cool project and repurposing something that that has been there for a long while. So that I think is going to be really, really cool. But um, is it, right now it's very much in its infancy, but um, definitely one for the future. In terms of other future conservation 
projects. One big one, unfortunately, is invasive species control. We have a number of non-native species and they can vary on the impact they can have on the environment and on the native populations of what well, the native wildlife that we have. So if you have been to the parks and have a very keen eye and look around Duck Island, you may have seen this in the top left here. We have terrapins. So we have, I think these are the yellow bellied sliders. I think that's what they're called. Last year, I counted as many as seven of them basking on the rock. They like to bask in the sun, but they're really, really quick. If you get remotely near them, they, they duck under the water. Whilst they look quite cool, they can live to around 40 years old and they can be quite destructive. They can feed on frogs, on tadpoles, on small fish. And they are originally from the United States. They're, they're not meant to be here and they actually can cause, like I say, quite a lot of damage. They are a consequence of pets being released back into the wild. We're not the only park that has it. I know Hyde Park do and many parks around the UK probably do. It's believed it the sort of craze orig originated around the 90s with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But once they realized that, hey, these things live for quite a long time, they people kind of rewild them, if you like, into their local park where they actually sometimes don't survive due to the cold weather, but also they make quite a big impact. Now the climate's changing, they seem to be surviving longer. So what we try and do, we catch as many as we can and we relocate them into reptile re re rehabilitation centers to try and get rehomed, to take them out of the population and live out the rest of their lives. Another big native, well, sorry, non-native animal we have are the gray squirrels. So you'll see them throughout almost every park now in, in, um, in England and in London in particular. So St. James's Park, we are inundated with gray squirrels. They do look quite cute. They are very tame. They are very friendly. They will come up and feed out your hand, which we've, we've seen many a time, but they actually are very destructive. The IUCN, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, put them in the top 100 worst inv invasive species in the world. So not just in the UK, in the entire world. They strip lots of bark off native trees, off oak, chestnut, beech, sycamore trees, they can eat songbird chicks, eggs, damage loads of crops, and also they outcompete the the native red squirrel, which really now has a strong hold in Scotland. They also carry a disease that the kills the red squirrel. So whilst they do look quite cute, we do our best to try and try and discourage people from feeding them, if you like, to try and uh, not make their populations expand too much and be too destructive. But on a happier note, I'll talk about our collection birds. So we do have a very a very varied range of collection birds, as I've touched on before, such as the black swans, the hooded mergansers, things like that. What we'd like to do next with our collection is go for a more native approach. So these will be wildfowl that you may find in the UK, but not necessarily found in central London. And it's our sort of way we historically had a collection. Regent's Park have a collection as well. But our collection birds are so mixed with the wild birds as they're all throughout the park. We want to have ones that are found within the UK, just have less of an impact of our invasive species. So in the bottom left picture here, we have the Euro uh, European shell duck. We have two of these shell duck. Well, I think we have two females and we actually had a wild male turn up from the coast last year. And I saw him again in um, January and uh, he bred with one of our collection birds, which is really cool. And these are all shell ducklings i think that's the right term but either way i hope it's the right term because it sounds really nice and on the bottom right here we have a smew as well which is part of our collection another uk bird which is really really pretty other birds we're talking about are eurasian teals northern pintails those sort of things so we haven't fully collated a list yet but that's the idea of where we'd like to go and in general we want to have cleaner safer parks for wildlife so that would be sort of trying to be more sustainable in in the cafes and what things we'll make, what things we'll use in terms of making sure all the parks are as clean as they can be. We actually have a system, uh, a massive machine that drags out all the sort of rubbish that's collected within the lake and get deposits it out so we can clean it as we go. So that's really cool. And on that top right picture, that is, I think, a grey lag goose nest from West Iden last year, which, uh, which just shows you how vulnerable they can be given their ground nesting. So it's important that we keep the islands as pest free as we can. So finally, I'm going to talk to you a little, about, a little bit about wildlife ID. So the tricks and the trades that, that I use and what anyone can use to ID birds, because it's not easy. In the last year, I found I got a lot better, but I know people who can spot a bird a mile away of binoculars 
and to me it'll look like a little black blob but to them they'll be able to name the exact species male or female whatever it may be um, I tend to use trusty book <laughs> my I've got my great uncle's book which is really useful in IDing birds and then I use a couple tricks as well so there's a website called eBird eBird is really quite useful it's where a lot of people who visit the park will post their sightings so they sometimes accompany pictures and they'll post what they see on a given day and it will change throughout the seasons as different birds turn up and yes it's you are sort of relying on people to correctly id but there's so many people on there that they're always sort of checking each other and their internal systems check it as well one i would highly recommend is the merlin app it's an app you can download i'm not plugging anything of mine by the way this is just apps i have found to be very useful and if you take a photo of, of the bird or even if you just say what rough area you are in and describe the features of the bird it should be able to tell you what it is I believe it can, you can even record the song of the bird or the sounds it makes and it should be able to ID for you, which I think is really quite cool. And uh, finally, if you are going through the parks, please look at the boards that we have around the park. I think we have some near the very bottom of the park near West Island and we have some near the benches towards the cafe as well. And they talk about the collection birds we have and also about the more common species that you'll find. So to give you an example, these are four common birds we find in the lake you've got the mute swan with its cygnets you've got the great crested grebe on the top right you have a common shoveler which visited us last year and they've got a sort of shoveled bill which you can see and we have the gray herons the gray herons and the cormorants are particularly difficult when it comes to feeding time with the pelicans because as i'm trying to feed them everyone turns up who likes fish so it becomes a bit of an ongoing battle try and make sure I can feed the pellies but if you are interested in ever seeing that it is between sort of 2 30 and 3 o'clock every day it's pelican depending it very much depends on if they want to show up and what time they want to show up but I aim for 2 30 it's either off the bridge towards Duck Island or it's on the other side of Duck Island Cottage and that is purely depending on what side of the lake the pelicans swim down I have no say in it at all they say never work with animals but uh they do make it entertaining and your excuse for being late is a very valid one if a pelican's wandering down the mall or heading down Whitehall or something like that. So that pretty much, oh hang on, I've got one more slide I forgot. So this for reference is the eBird sighting page. So to give you an idea, if you type in St James's Park, it will show you what species have been found, who recorded them and what dates they were. So, and usually accompany pictures as well. So it's a really useful site if you're interested. But that pretty much brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yes, I, I think Addy mentioned we'll have some questions as well. So yeah, uh, please fire away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I particularly enjoyed learning about the, how climate change and human impacts are affecting the pelicans feeding. Um, and as well about the conservation. So thank you so much. We will, we will have some time for questions, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. So the first question I would like to ask you um, is, have any of the pelicans ever flown away? And you've kind of answered some of that already. Um, yeah, I've answered some of it. And um, what I'd say, the only one that has flown away is Gargi. So yeah, last year she went to Richmond, she went to the Thames. I have heard that she goes up to Regent's Park because they and tries to steal the fish that they have at London Zoo as well. And the other pelicans, as they can't fly, don't tend to fly away, but they do walk away a lot. So I did mention that they go down Whitehall, but m one of their most favourite spots is actually the palace beds. So they leave West Island area, walk up onto the Mall, onto the palace beds, right by the roundabout, and it generates a huge crowd and it's exciting to see but it's a bit of a heart and mouth moment when i don't know where the pelicans are <laughs> so that's always quite entertaining that's fantastic thank you and um someone has also asked why is one pelican on its own during the winter and is also asking if they feel the cold ah that's a, a really good question so not this year but over the last two years we've had to house the pelicans inside. So I mentioned the quarantine area that actually is used when the pelicans come in, but also when there is a large outbreak of avian flu. 
So we had a housing order put on us by DEFRA to bring all the pelicans in. And it in their quarantine area, it has a net over the top. It has an indoor area and an outdoor area with pools, so the pelicans can explore. But unfortunately, it's not as big as the lake, but it's to protect them from any birds coming into the park that may have avian flu. Two years ago, we managed to collect all six. But last year, to my knowledge, we collected five. Gargi knew what everyone was trying to do and kept flying to the other side of the lake. So essentially, there was one because we couldn't catch her and uh, she took her chances so she spent about four months on her own um and then when we let all the others out within about an hour they were all integrated again which was really nice but uh, that would have been why you would have just seen one fantastic um another question that's related to the pelicans is whether they take um other prey or birds as less uh, uh, to eat sorry Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they do. It's, I haven't seen it personally. I've seen it on videos and other things of them taking pigeons and whatnot in the park. But uh, usually what they'll take is fish. So they, we have fish and we actually have our fish is frozen and we each each day will defrost around about a kilo each. That's what they can eat. They can eat about a kilo a day and that equates to about four to six fish, depending on its size. And in winter, they'll come up fairly regularly, but in summer, I might go three days without seeing them. And that's actually because they're finding fish of their own in the lake. We have a self-sustaining population of fish. I think it's mainly carp that we have. And if you ever see them in the lake, they'll all be in a big circle, kind of with their bills going inwards, and they're finding fish themselves. So it is predominantly what they eat is fish. They don't mind my fish, but I think they prefer the fish of the lake. There are fish, and that's already answered one of the next questions about uh, whether there are fish in the lake. Yeah. lake. Yes, um, and then we've got a lot of questions about the feeding um, that goes on in St James's Park. So, um, someone's asked: Is is there anything the experts would like the public to do or not do to help encourage wildlife to flourish in St James's Park? That's a really nice question. Um, in general, yeah, the um, the park, St James's Park, is an interesting one. We have so many different stakeholders. It's probably the high the one of the busiest royal parks i can't i think it is i don't want to claim it definitely is oh it is okay it definitely is the busiest and the sheer number of people coming through means there's a lot of interaction with wildlife but at the same time it's still an amazing oasis so what i would say is please enjoy the wildlife take as many pictures as you can share it but um take up please take all your litter with you for one that's one thing that's always a big issue and please if you can avoid trying to feed them so in general particularly over winter, people can feed feed birds in their local parks and usually that's OK. The um, If you feed them just a little bit and even a little bit of bread itself doesn't tend to kill kill the bird. It will just if they only had bread, they'd be quite malnourished. The issue we have is we have new people every 15, 20 minutes. So as good intentions as they are, we do get unfortunately sometimes overweight birds. I think uh, on a large count, a few of our coots were above the national average. I think they were over about 1.3 kilo and they should have been about eight, 900 grams. So we have a few fat birds <laughs> essentially. So um, if please enjoy the birds, take pictures, but try your best not to feed them. They are wild animals at the end of the day and they'll find their own food. So they do, yeah, they normal. do. Um, we've got a question that's just come in from Natalie asking, um, how long is it before the cygnets from last year breed? Oh, that's a good question. So we have, how many do we have left? We have three cygnets. They are still sort of a bit in their downy colours, so they're, they're quite large, but um, it won't be this year. I imagine the earliest it would be would be next year. But um, the real issue they have with swans is they can be very, very dominant and very protective and territorial. So at some point, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they might have to move on and find their own habitat or their own sort of territory. because um, dad might try and oust them out of St James's Park. You do get very dominant birds that will chase each other and you'll see them sort of on top of the lake with sort of their wings out, kind of picking up speed. So I imagine it's more likely we'll have signals this year from the existing adults that we have. And I think someone's just asked what the origin of black, the black swans are. So black swans, they are in fact an Australian bird. So they're quite a common sight in 
wildlife collections. So you'll see them probably throughout different collections within the UK, but they are non-native. Um, they're really cool. They're actually slightly smaller than the mute swan with that red eyes and the red beak. Um, they occupy a fairly similar sort of habitat and they coexist fairly well with our mute swans. There's one on the left hand side of the my last slide was um, that one in the little swan bag. And uh, she doesn't like me now, but I took her to get examined because she had a stick caught in her abdomen. So we had to get her make sure she was OK. So she hates me, but she was actually absolutely fine. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Nick. That answers Maria's question on what was going on with that. Um, <laughs> um, Hang on, I can, got, I can reshare it if that helps. Hang on. Yeah. Um, got a few more questions. Keep them coming in. We'll answer as many as we can. So, yeah, there, there she is. Yeah, that <laughs> one there. So she, um, she had a stick caught in her abdomen, and I wasn't sure how deep it was actually. So um, we put her in the swan bag, which is essentially like a, a restraint jacket it stops them stops their wings from moving out i put her in the back of our car and drove her to the swan sanctuary we have a nice connection with the swan sanctuary and um it was about an hour drive each way i think something like that and it turned out it was only about half a centimeter deep they just pulled out the stick put a distant bit of disinfectant on and uh, i was good to go which i was like oh i probably could have done that myself but uh better to be safe than sorry i guess Okay, we'll take a few more questions. Um, are there any issues from predators like foxes or cats to the birds in the nests on Duck Island? Um, that's a good question. So I haven't seen many cats. I do think well, we do have a few residences around, so it wouldn't be impossible to see some cats in the park. We do have foxes, not as many as some of the other parks, but they don't they haven't actually managed to get onto the island yet. So Duck Island, whilst it has a bridge, it does have this quite large gate around it. So something small, potentially like a squirrel, might be able to get on, but a fox can't actually fit through. So they may predate on the ones that are around the, the bank of the water, which is very possible. But to be fair, there's so many more birds than there are foxes that the impacts they're making aren't having any any effect. And I quite like foxes. They're, they're a native animal and they need to sort of feed their kits as well so it kind of it works in the cycle really okay so then this is um are all the pelicans um or other captive birds female or do you let them breed ah this is a good question so with our pelicans we have two males and that is sun and moon and then star tiffany isla and gargi are all females they theoretically there's nothing stopping them breeding they um, even looked like they almost built a nest last year. It looked like they were putting a lot of sticks together, which was quite confusing. But uh, pelicans tend to prefer to breed in much larger groups. So it's highly unlikely that we'll have eggs or baby pelicans. What other zoos do actually, which is really cool, they'll put mirrors around enclosures to imitate a large flock. And that has proven to be successful and had breeding success within smaller collections, which is quite astonishing. And then in the collection birds we had, we normally do bring them in pairs. I think there are occasional pairs, but not every single one. So, for example, the Hawaiian geese we have, we have two Hawaiian geese or Nene geese, and they're both girls. So I think it's it's a mix, I think. So um, we've got just a couple more questions. Um, someone has asked whether Egyptian geese mate for life. and following on from that that they've heard that swans mate for life um what would happen when a mate dies that's from Anne. okay so um the egyptian geese that i've seen do they're very territorial they pair up and they have very strong pair groups as well so you'll see them the male and the female both both very involved in the breeding period they're actually starting to breed now i think our first pair had goslings last week so they're quite an early early season bird if you like so um again and they they tend to nest quite high in trees they're very aggressive when they're they're mating as well they um they fight off other males where they'll have their beaks sort of caught up whacking each other with wings so it can be quite violent but once they've got their pair they're quite tight knit and with swans they to my knowledge they pair for life but i'm not certain what would happen if one does die i'd be um i might have to look that up i'd be surprised i i would I would hazard a guess that if it was possible, they might remate at some stage, but um, I'm not actually certain on that one. Thank you. 
Um, we've still got some time, so I'll ask uh, two or three more. Um, mm. This one is from Tasha. I saw a goose with a messed up wing uh, a few weeks ago in St. James's Park. Is fighting an injury, are fighting and injuries common among the birds? Um, yes, yes, they are. As I say, with the Egyptian geese in particular, they can be quite aggressive towards one another. So can the coots. If you ever see the coots, they'll rear up and they'll hit with their back legs. So you'll often see a coot with a limp. And again, with the swans, the goose you might be thinking of we do have one egyptian goose in the park that has angel wing and that's a condition where the primary flight feather has been twisted during development so one of its wings is sort of sticking out like that and it's absolutely fine it just means it it can't fly effectively so it happened during development there's not a lot you can do it might make it a bit more vulnerable to a fox or something like that but otherwise it's absolutely fine and the year I've been here, it is it's been it's it's done really well. So I've just seen it walking around the lake, swimming fine. It just sticks his arm out to the side, basically. Thank you. Um, so we've got two more questions. Um, then this one is: Where is the most strange place that you have found the pelicans? If you haven't already shared that. Mm. So I guess the strangest one that the parks would say is down in that hotel, but um, that was before I joined. So for for me, it was uh, just beyond the palace gates, a little bit further down. So the where um, part of Birdcage Walk meets Spur Road is in that corner, not too far from the palace. Four of them were in the cycle lane, where um, which is quite a common route for bikes to come through. And this was about quarter to nine in the morning on a Tuesday or something like that. So I had some very, <laughs> had a, I was inundated with, um, with commuters kind of going left and right. And I felt like, um, I think it's Chris Pratt from Jurassic World. Where I just had my arms out stopping bikes and trying to, trying to put to navigate the Pelicans back in. The issue they have is the Pelicans can get out of the park, but then people get quite excited to see them and that they can't really remember how they get back. So, uh, they, they just keep going the wrong way. They've been into Green Park a few times as well. Thank you. And this will be our, our last question, which is a double question from Steve. Um, what's your favourite wildlife sighting in St. James's Park? And also, if you were a bird, what bird would you be? <laughs> I like those questions. OK, what is my best sighting? My favourite sighting within the park um, it probably was the reed warbler, as I mentioned before, just because, as I mentioned, we didn't actually have many reed beds historically. And to get the reed warblers as an established population was just really quite exciting. So I'd probably say reed warblers. Kingfishers are always a fantastic sight if you're ever going through the park. I'm a big fan of them. And um, I haven't seen one, but the one on my list my boss has seen is a peregrine falcon that has flown over the park. Uh, so I'm yet to see. So that's on my list. I keep looking up. Um, if I could be a bird, it would probably, it might be a peregrine falcon. They're the fastest animal in the world. They can get to 200 miles an hour. Or a frigate bird. Have you ever seen them? They, um, they got this massive wingspan and they just look so lazy. They just fly across the world and they don't even look like they're trying. So I think maybe a frigate bird. Thank you so much. And thank you for thinking on your on your feet and for such a wonderful presentation today. A big thanks to everyone who's jo has joined to us tonight. If you did enjoy and, you, and you'd like to donate to support our work, then there is a link in the chat with that for that, uh, along with a link to our future online talks. We also have some exciting walking tours going on and other in-person events. So if you check out our What's On page, the link for that is in the chat. Um, and I must give a special mention for our next um, the next talk in our winter warmer series, which is on the 21st of March, we will be learning about the haven for wildlife that is Bushy Park, one of our eight rural parks. So please do join that, join our park manager, Phil, to find out about the work that the Bushy Parks team have been doing during winter to prepare the park for a new season of growth, discover what to look out for as warming temperatures, catapult us into spring a bit earlier, and learn about the flora and fauna that call this park home from deer to protected yellow meadow ants. It's going to be a fascinating evening, again, available to you for free, so don't miss it. And you can sign up through the link in the chat. So I hope to see you all there. 
Thank you again for joining tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you soon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody.